Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Lifetime Legacy Lawyer Podcast. I'm your co-host, Thomas Vick, joined by Seth Wilson, the other co-host of this podcast. Seth, how are you today? Thomas, we are doing great. It is a uh, fast approaching spring, so we're looking forward to it. We've been spoiled with some nice sunny weather over the last couple of weeks and days and kind of getting used to that. So looking at green grass starting to come up and the flowers starting to bud, I think it's going to be a, a lot of fun. Just kind of renews the energy for this next March through March, so to speak, yeah. and get, getting us ready for more uh, clients to serve. So lots of fun. Lots of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Spring break for a lot of people is coming up here in a few weeks. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, but when spring break happens, it's a little bit quieter in my office. But the week before spring break, it's a rush because everybody has to get stuff done before. So looking forward to, to that and preparing for it. And, you know, we'll be ready. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, kind of thinking about that, you know, we have new beginnings uh, it, with spring coming in and we also have endings. And so we were, we were talking as we got started here today, just thinking through kind of what happens in a, a state administration when you reach the end of the administration. What are the steps that the personal representative or the executor is going to have to take to actually finalize and close up that estate? Yeah, it's a great topic. And, you know, it's one of the most important aspects of an individual who is administering uh, an estate of a loved one or whoever the, the decedent might be. Uh, there are certain t steps that have to be taken in order to close out an estate administration. And, uh, you know, an accounting is the major one, right? So, uh, in an unsupervised estate, even though you don't have to file it with the court. You still have to prepare uh, an accounting, which means you got to tell the uh, you you know you got to document where all of the funds came from, all the assets, and then you got to have receipts for all of the disbursements that you've made. You know whatever bills that have been paid, creditors paid off, and you got to um, you know provide that to the, all the other beneficiaries of the estate so that they have an understanding of what what happened. But the accounting is one of the most important things that needs to be done in order to close out an estate. Yeah, and we often talk about it um, with our clients who are the personal representative of the estate. And to be clear, th this is a situation where either the, the decedent passed with a will um, and, and not a trust and needed that probate process to give the personal representative the authority to act on behalf of the estate and carry out the terms of the will, or in an intestate situation where the decedent did not have a will and therefore the kind of the default rules of the land apply. And so those scenarios have different levels of complexity associated with them. And, and as you might expect, when you have no plan, the complexity increases in terms of the workload for the personal representative to figure out who the beneficiaries are and what the shares are and those kind of things because it's not clearly spelled out in the documents. And so you're you're kind of taking what that plan was in terms of the will and the personal representative is just detailing what he or she may have done to carry out the terms of the will. Here are the assets that we found. Here's who are the recipients and here's what we did with all of them. And here's the documentation that any of the other beneficiaries might be able to look at and ask questions of. And if they have questions, then they can file some sort of uh, request with the court to have that question answered, so to speak. And once that's done, that process just closes, closes out. So I always tell the clients at the front end, we kind of want to begin with the end in mind. What are we going to be able to do or need to do to close this estate out in a couple of months? and make sure that we have a good plan for getting that estate bank account open so we have those statements and we can track things that came in and out very easily. What might have been paid out of pocket prior to that? Do we have receipts for all of those things? And just make sure we can build out um, a good accounting from really ground zero to till the last penny is ready to be distributed. Yeah, and... and you know, if a court is uh, doing an estate administration with supervision present, 
the court is going to scrutinize the accounting. So it, the beneficiaries may not have any issues with it, but the court has to be uh, uh, good with whatever you have submitted with your accounting. And so there are some local rules that have to be complied with, and certain um, counties have different requirements on what is required uh, in submitting the the estate administration's accounting. But um, you know, knowing your local rules is really important uh, for attorneys to help out their clients to to make sure that everything is in accordance with the the judge's expectations. Um, so, you know, with the accounting done, and let's say that that's approved, um, sometimes there are some options that are available for how assets are distributed to beneficiaries. Uh, what are some ways that that attorneys decide to distribute assets to beneficiaries, Seth? Yeah, it, it, it comes down to what the shares are and, and how mm -hmm. those shares are divided up, right? So you, you kind of have the big picture plan, but sometimes it's difficult to divide up a particular asset, like real estate, for example. And so when you're looking at those communication becomes very important among the beneficiaries. And by agreement, you can do pretty much whatever you want to do as long as everybody signs off on it and is comfortable with that agreement. Another thing we will do sometimes is if there's not a specific requirement in the documentation left by the will, then we will kind of write out what we think from the personal representative's perspective and discretion as given to them by the will, what should happen as a proposed plan for distribution. So we'll say, you know, these these are the funds that remain. Here's how we propose handling the distribution of those and then give that notice to the recipients so that they can say, well, I don't agree with that. And then they can file a claim or an objection to that accounting and say, this is what I'd prefer to have happen if we can't get that agreement. So uh, number one, communication. Communicate with everybody keep them apprised throughout the process. And then number two, you seek those agreements of, hey, this is kind of the proposed distribution plan. What does everybody think about it? Especially in those cases where you may need to do a specific type of asset distribution, a specific way to accommodate what everybody's looking for. Yes. And and some of the the choices that are made with regard to distribution may not necessarily be about uh, what percentage or what type of asset but it may be uh, the type of beneficiary that you have. So the one that I'm thinking of is an underage beneficiary, a minor child. Well, a minor child can't technically own property. So there has to be some way for that minor beneficiary to uh, get the benefit of the, the distribution, but also not being able to really get to it. Somebody has to be able to uh, take care of that property for them. And there are a couple different ways of, of doing that, at, at least that come to mind right now. One is a, a Uniform Transfers to Minors Act account or a custodial account that the personal representative or maybe the parent could set up for the minor beneficiary. And then that can be held for the minor, minor beneficiary's benefit up until age 21. And then the minor who becomes an adult can then take control of that asset and then use it however he or she sees fit. Another way is by the personal representative establishing a trust for that beneficiary, that minor beneficiary, and maybe a, a parent will hold on to the money through a trust. Maybe the, maybe the decedent directed that a trust be established and no distributions to be made until age 25. It could be used for the, the beneficiary's benefit between you know, now and then, but uh, the beneficiary doesn't have control over the asset until age 25, something like that. So a trust or a UTMA account, uh, those are a couple options, but there may be some other types of beneficiaries that need, uh, you know, special attention. Yeah. So any, any beneficiary that might be on some sort of means tested benefits could also, um, could cause them issues if they receive a lump sum payout from an estate, for example. And so if, if authorized either by law or by the documents themselves, 
the personal representative could establish a supplemental or special needs trust for that individual to protect those means tested benefits from being jeopardized as a result of a larger gift from the estate. And so those, those are options to consider as well as the personal representative is working through that process. And that's why I think it's super helpful uh, in, in any time to have the attorneys involved because this is what we do and we're aware of these kinds of issues. And we know which questions to ask as we're looking kind of across all the things that need to be done and, and the part of the administration process and really help address some of these questions as they come up and maybe even come up with some solutions that are, are creative, but again, are agree, agreed to by everyone through some sort of family settlement agreement that would get approved by the court, even if that may deviate a little bit from what the, the will would say, but everybody's okay with it because maybe the, the personal representative is also the testamentary trustee or you know one and the same kind of person. So lots of different options that are available that don't take away from the intent and the documentation of what's done, but just how practically um, those assets are transitioned from one person to another. Yeah. And another beneficiary that fits into that category of um, a beneficiary of a special needs trust might be the surviving spouse of the decedent. So if, you know, the, the spouse who has passed away maybe was a healthy spouse and then there was also a, a spouse that's in a nursing home on Medicaid, um, in all likelihood, the will says that everything goes to the surviving spouse. But in that case, you got a problem because if everything goes to the surviving spouse, the surviving spouse probably will lose Medicaid benefits and then won't have a way of affordably paying for uh, long-term care in a nursing home. And so a provision that allows for a, a trust to be established for the surviving spouse that is a, a special needs trust, that's a great way of protecting the surviving spouse's benefits so that no no loss of coverage is, um, is experienced when, you know, the healthy spouse passes away. So, you know, uh, estate attorneys have a lot of options sometimes in how we can protect beneficiaries' interests through how we, how we do distribution to the yeah. beneficiaries. Yeah. And that, and that kind of goes to the planning part of things as well, because you want to make sure that the, the documents that you are putting together, if that's a will, for example, has some sort of power left in it for the personal representative at the time to make that determination. And you right. pre-authorized your personal representative to kind of take a second look at things when the first spouse passes to determine that if we just transfer all of the assets from one spouse to the other, will that impair them for some other reason that maybe when we put the documents together, we weren't anticipating. And, and so that's always something to keep in mind because lawyers kind of tend to think in worst case scenarios anyway, <laughs> for better or worse, that that's kind of what comes with the territory. And so we're trying to anticipate down the road, you know, what we, can reasonably anticipate and what we know are the two things we typically plan for. And so we kind of look at that and say, okay, do you have a family history of needing long-term care? Is there, you know, that possibility on the horizon? Maybe we want to consider these options as we're doing the estate plan so that when we get to the administration, then we have as many options available to us to protect that estate as we can. Yeah. So let's say that we have gotten our accounting finished and we're in a supervised estate, for whatever reason, we don't have the authority to proceed with an unsupervised administration of the estate. So um, we file the accounting with the court, and then alongside that is a petition for the court to approve the final accounting. But, um, you know, and if we, if we have consents for all parties that are involved, then we can uh, probably get the, the hearing waived so that there doesn't have to be a hearing and then distribution, final distribution can be made. But there is a potential for there to be another hearing, um, you know, a, a hearing on the final account. And then that's an opportunity for anybody that 
as an objection to bring an objection and then have a have a hearing with the court to listen to the arguments and see uh, what what is the right thing to do. So that's why, you know, when we're talking about doing your estate plan, make sure that you've got the authority uh, given to your personal representative to proceed in an unsupervised administration because potentially there'll be a hearing that is uh, set where there's a forum for any potential beneficiary to um, raise an objection and for there to be, you know, if there's a hearing, there's potential for protracted litigation with that from my point of view. So that's sort of, you know, what I see in a, at the end stage of a supervised administration. Yeah. It, and that's, even if the litigation is not extensive, uh, and the term litigation may, you may think it's very acrimonious or adversarial, it doesn't always have to be that way in an estate administration. It just means it takes additional attorney time. So you've got to prepare for the hearing. You've got to be ready to answer the judge's questions. You've got to make sure that that objection is addressed appropriately. So it just, it takes more time and it costs more estate resources to walk through that and if that's the intent of the plan, that's okay. And we understand that when we're planning. But if your intent was to make this as easy as possible and as less costly as possible for the overall estate, then there are additional options that you should make sure your documents have to authorize that unsupervised administration so that things can progress a little bit. Make sure that the personal representative has the appropriate discretionary authority to make the decisions where there may be a decision that needs to be made. And it's not up to everybody to make that decision. Um, again, you can do more things proactively through the plan to get there. And obviously we've talked about this a lot on the podcast of where that trust is beneficial because you don't need the court. If you've funded the trust appropriately, then the trustee has the discretion to make those asset transfers as appropriate. So yeah. lots of good things to think about, but again, uh, you know, every situation is different and there's not a one size fits all approach to any of this. And a lot of times you don't get to choose the situation that you find yourself in, <laughs> yeah. you know, you, you may be thinking, well, it'd be great if we had a plan, but there wasn't a plan in this situation. So what do we do? And so that's, that's the time really to reach out to the attorney and walk through and see what the options are and, and just get an explanation of how that process is going to work and what, what the issues are going to be. Yeah, absolutely. And talk to a, an estate planning attorney, a state administration attorney, and they'll be able to uh, figure out what exactly needs to be done. Well, good discussion today. Seth, anything else you want to add to what we've talked about today? No, I think that it's just the context that we see uh, a lot of this scenario come up for for our clients who do planning is they have worked through a process with a loved one where they were um, either close to as a beneficiary or the actual administrator of the estate and they realize i may not want this to happen in my scenario and so what are the options what can we do and the questions that they're asking us on the planning side and and through the administration side and so that's just a normal part of of life and how it happens and it's uh just it's good to be well versed on what what to expect i think yeah and i agree with you one of the most common things that clients say to me is i want to talk about my stuff and also somebody else's stuff and usually you know it, when somebody says that it's somebody's going through you know, maybe nursing home stuff when, you know, they're talking about elder law for a, a loved one and then their own estate planning, or it might be, uh, I've got an individual, you know, the potential client might have a loved one who passed away. And then they also want to talk about their own estate planning. And so they're, you know, events in life give attention to this type of uh, need that people need to address, you know, so. Uh, good discussion today. Um, Seth, how can everybody reach you? I am located up here in the heart of Hamilton County in Noblesville, Indiana, and our web address is noblesvilleattorney.com. That's the easiest way to find us. How about you, Thomas? And the best way to reach me is viclaw.org. You can go on the website and book a call 
Very simple. Viclaw.org. I appreciate it. As always, Seth, we'll talk to you next time. Thanks, everybody. Sounds great, Thomas. See you later.